we're going to be hearing from Alison Pal Palfreman um, about special schooling. Alison lives with her husband, Theodore, and two children. Uh, her swan child, Sophie, who's eight today. Happy birthday, Lucy, uh, Sophie, sorry. Uh, and Johnny, age three. Um, Sophie was diagnosed with Rubenstein Tabby syndrome at seven weeks old um, and Duane syndrome three months uh, at three months of age. So welcome to you, Alison, and we will be setting up and listening to your presentation and you'll be joining us for some Q&A at the end. Hi everyone, how are we all today? I hope you're all well. Uh, thanks for joining into the conference um, and to hear everybody's stories. And today I'll be talking to you about navigating school and all those decisions that come with that. Um, so my name is Alison and I've got an eight year old little girl. Um, her name is Sophie. And I've also got a three year old little boy named Johnny. Um, so with Sophie, she actually does have a diagnosis. We're quite grateful for that. Um, Sophie's diagnosis is uh, rubenstein tabey syndrome and she also actually has Duane syndrome. Um, so uh, rubenstein tabey syndrome, um, she was diagnosed at seven weeks old. Um, that was just after me noticing some angulation to her thumbs. Um, so we needed to, yeah, do gen or they suggested genetics testing and so on. So, um, as any parent, your main concern is just that your kids are healthy and okay. So, um, yeah, once we received the RTS diagnosis, um, it's just been, I suppose, uh, as everybody knows, a learning process, just trying to work and navigate what's the right thing for our family, what's the right thing for Sophie, um, make sure that we're the biggest advocates that we possibly could be for, for any child really, but also especially a child who's actually uh, non-verbal. Um, and so just trying to work out, yeah, which way we should go with everything. It gets tricky, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, so um, with the, I suppose I'll start at kindergarten, just little bits about kindergarten because that actually navigated our decisions to which way we should go with school. Um, with kindergarten, we did actually try for three-year-old kinder. Um, I, we enrolled her into three-year-old kinder, um, but Sophie's actually, so Rubenstein, sorry, background on Rubenstein Tabby intellectual disability milestones are at least double to triple time achieved um non-verbal will yeah so it's um yeah quite, as everything it's quite varied so um for us so as a three-year-old sophie was yeah absolutely non-verbal um more like a baby one-year-old around that sort of age so um, we did take her to kinder um, and I can just remember sort of seeing her sitting there in the room. She wasn't actually, she couldn't walk at that stage either. Um, just noticing that the children weren't interacting with her. The teachers didn't really know how to interact with Sophie um, and just noticed that she was actually sitting there by herself not and I'm quite sure that it was like cognitively actually didn't understand what was going on um so that was only a few weeks that we did three-year-old kinder um so then I decided to stop that just I just realized in a place within ourselves that she wasn't ready um and I want school to be a positive experience so um we actually stopped three-year-old kinder and then um, we did do mainstream so again this was a mainstream kindergarten um, so we did then we led into four-year-old kinder um, so with four-year-old kinder so if it was enrolled everything was the same and we were actually trying to fighting for to get kiss funding um, it took the first six months actually with back and forwards with reports to try and get the kiss funding um, so Sophie was actually at kinder 
with teachers that weren't experienced with children with special needs. Sophie again was so non-verbal. She was walking, but very unstable. Loves to climb. She's got the confidence of a lion, um, but she, her abilities out sort of <laughs> much less than her, um, yeah, her confidence, which is great that she wants to try, but it also means that she's going to fall and hurt herself. Um, so just no guidance with Kinder. Um, it was quite challenging and awful that sending your child somewhere that you know that she loves the social aspect but is also getting left behind with um with the mainstream kids that were yeah running around doing all sorts of things and then i just noticed that sophie again was getting excluded from play um during that six months that we were trying to get the kiss funding so eventually by midterm, we did get the KISS funding, um, which meant that she could have an aide come to the school and be with her um, full time. But <laughs> with the, for that, um, so with her aide, so this lady was meant to be there for, so she, apparently they're meant to be there for the, all the children, not just for Sophie. Um, but yeah, so again, I was just still finding that Sophie was trying to navigate a playground by herself, um, trying to just run along after the, you know, her friends and just the kids were actually ignoring her or they just didn't know how to interact with a nonverbal child. Um, although Sophie's got so many natural gestures to try and get her point across. Um, so it's quite hard as a parent watching a child sit back and just, um, yeah, it's just, you know, you want these children to, but they're children, it's not, it's that awful feeling of you understand kids are kids, they don't understand what's going on um, and why, you know, they'd say, why can't Sophie talk? And so all those natural questions, innocent questions that kids ask um, and trying to answer those and... I just don't think the teachers actually knew how to answer those questions either and they didn't know how to include Sophie to be equal with her peers. You know, if they did need to clean up, Sophie needs to do all of those, you know, activities with everybody, not sort of set aside and um yeah, treated differently. So um yeah, it was quite a it's, I mean, any, anything we do with our kids is just an emotional experience anyway. Um, but her aide actually was quite often away as well and the kinder wouldn't let me know. They'd say, oh, we don't know if um, this lady's turning up or not. Um, so then they hadn't organised a replacement, um, which meant, again, Sophie's going out into the playground, climbing up at really high heights and was actually quite at risk um, of hurting herself, um, which the teacher, the kindergarten teacher, which I found it was actually her first year of kindergarten teaching. Um, she was quite happy just to let, so she's like, no, she can do it, it's fine. Um, so yeah, trying to, so then it sort of become a thing of, I spoke to Sophie's pediatrician about this and she actually said that it's actually safer to keep Sophie at home rather than send her to kinder to play with her friends. So that's just, again, that exclusion of, okay, so Sophie has to stay home rather than the kindergarten organizing to have steps in place to be able to include Sophie into the play, into their activities and um, also their indoor activities as well and whether the group, um, so, yeah, it was quite an eye opener with, um, yeah, with the mainstream side of things, like just that awareness of safety as well. Yeah, um, they'd also go do so with the bush kinder. They'd go for a walk down to a creek and just let the kids run wild. Um, whereas they just really didn't understand, no matter how much I say to them, Sophie has got no awareness of danger no awareness that if she steps in walks into the creek that something bad will happen um that the, the roads just everything they just didn't understand so um 
just that assumption of treat which you know that Sophie would understand so that all sort of played a part throughout four-year-old kinder on what we should actually do for school um, and we were still looking mainstream or special school um, but then it wasn't until actually another parent of a child with the same um, RTS diagnosis as Sophie um, she mentioned the safety like as far as the gates are locked so and then it clicked I was like oh playgrounds that's you know when the kids in a mainstream school decide to go out and play um, they're actually out there playing and they you see kids running along the fence because they know they're not allowed to go outside the gate um, and they can play in their little friends groups and I realized then that okay mainstream's not going to be for us just mainly even just for that of many one of many decisions but that main decision of that she will not understand that you can't just walk out the school gate um, you do need to stay with your teachers or your friends um, and I know that with mainstream school the outdoor play although there are yard duty teachers it's probably yeah still a lot of free play which is great for kids that you know can get out there they understand that they can't go any further um, so that was one big decision like once that sort of was brought to my attention um, that with a special school the gates are obviously higher they've got safety locks um, and the teachers are interacting all the time with the children because they actually need to have um, that extra assistance in their play um, so that was a big decision like with the main leading towards the special school um, then the small like I suppose the class sizes so class sizes with a mainstream school uh, I think they're around the 20 22 children to one teacher and then um, if you do if you are able to get an aid again it's that shared aid throughout if there are any other children in the class with any additional needs um, which gets a bit tricky again and then having that bad experience with an age at kindergarten again sort of lent towards that well maybe we do need to go to a special school because if she is in mainstream the age doesn't turn up or what have you then that does get again just going back to those old um, patterns of not having been able to send Sophie because there isn't anyone there to assist her um, so that were pretty much the big reasons for us to lead towards uh, a special school. Um, so Sophie now, we actually was, we had a great experience too with meeting with, we met with Ascot Vale Special School. They've now changed their name to Ascot Vale Heights School. Um, so the vice principal there, Christine, was uh, quite lovely and welcoming with um, yeah, getting Sophie on board and um, getting all the assessments done to be able to send her to the school. Um, we felt comfortable. We felt like the staff were a united group, um, that they welcomed us. They remembered Sophie each time we went to visit, um, which was quite nice that um, just to have that acknowledgement of remembering um, each child as well because we just again felt that in a mainstream school there's so many children um, that how can they possibly remember everybody's name and know anyone's situation um, we didn't look at any other schools I was researched uh, a couple of other different special schools and specialist schools um, but I just think for us because Sophie is able to walk she is um, her intellectual disability uh, fell on the borderline though with the um, Ascot Vale Special School of 50. So I think it's between 50 and 75 for the special school um, to be able to go to this school. And we did want Sophie to have, like, be able to work with her peers and have her peers that could um, challenge her in a, like, in a positive way as well. That was another... Um, reason to yeah go to Ascot Vale Heights School um, so 
that was, yeah, that's our reasoning behind wanting to go to Ascot Vale. Um, we, the transitions were really good with the school uh, each. So we actually did the cognitive assessment at the school. Sophie was more than comfortable to walk in. And um, yeah, I think that just because all the teachers and staff, all the staff were friendly to her and to us. Um, and I've actually realized in one of the meetings with, uh, with the vice principal that I just, just go into auto mode of explaining diagnosis, therapists, different things that we need to do and then start to explain or I suppose justify why we have to do these things and Christine was like, yeah. <laughs> and it was the first time that I'd actually spoken to somebody outside of our household, like family, friends, that actually understood why, like they knew why we have to go down these different, whether it's sensory processes, um, uh, assisted dressing so if you're still in nappies um yeah so it was actually nice it was refreshing to sit back and go oh yeah somebody else understands it somebody else understands what we need to do what we need to go through um because that's the it's a special school and it was like comforting to know that they understood why we do certain things and respected the way that um yeah we the way that we do things with sophie uh, so yeah, with the school, um, the class sizes also, so class sizes, there's only, I think up to 10, that's actually a very small school. It's from prep to year 12. Um, and there's only about a hundred students all up in the whole school. So just having not as many children, um, at the school, it's not as busy. And so with our kids that can get quiet anxious with um, lots of movement, lots of sounds. Um, that's, yeah, that was quite nice to know as well. Uh, so Sophie's class at this year, so she did prep last year, obviously lockdown, so it was mainly me, lucky her, um, teaching her. So this year's pretty much been the first year of school, proper school for Sophie. Um, and there's only eight kids in her class, um, which is nice um there's actually three so one teacher and two assistants so having three adults in the class at all times um has been also another a pretty big draw card to have eight students three adults um to assist their children so there's always somebody to be able to work with the kids or if somebody needs to obviously we're, most of our children at this age are doing um toileting so there's always going to be that extra like at least two children two staff in the room while somebody's taking if they need to take a child to the toilet um or they all will actually line up and say okay toilet time off we go so um yeah with all those extra so yeah sophie's also non-verbal um, and the school uses a vase. So just being that welcoming to um, take on those uh, assistive technology programs, um, whether it's like, so they actually do use PECs as well, um, of like this, the electronic devices um, and sign language they've started to, so because we actually use sign language to communicate with Sophie. So they've learned a few more keyword signs and they do have a two speech pathologist that work casual at the school, but not in the classroom as such with the kids. They just teach the staff as a whole um, and assist them with any needs that they might have with um, speech pathology or just education with the electronic device and also, yes, yeah, some extra signs. So that's, yeah, quite comforting because we've sort of, I suppose, taken with Sophie a whole language communication approach where um, we do, yeah, sign. We've got the speech programs and also to strip it back down if she's not coping with any of those, we do go back to um, the uh, picture communication, which then she can just simply see the picture and, yeah, communicate with us a little bit easier. So... Uh, I think that's pretty much with the school that's the main reasoning for us. Obviously everything is such a personal choice 
everyone's got different um, stages where they're at with any of the diagnosis. Um, we, I suppose for us, as I said, had a, a diagnosis, so we had a bit more of a path. We know um, with milestones where roughly where they're going to be met and um, with any kind of other illnesses. So that maybe made it easier for us. Um, but yeah, I certainly feel comfortable and much more comfortable sending Sophie to a special school. Um, yeah, but it's obviously up to everybody. Um, your own personal experiences, your child, what they can and can't cope with. But I suppose safety, small class sizes, extra teachers and teachers that are actually trained with children with additional needs and they understand. So um, yeah, that were all the points to go tick, tick, tick for us for special school. Um, who knows down the track if Sophie is ready for a mainstream school, we'll see how we go. But at this stage, that's where we're at. Um, hopefully that's helped answer anyone's questions or if you are on the fence of do we, don't we. Um, Hopefully that's helped raise a few things. Um, good luck. Hope everybody stays well in these crazy times. And um, yeah, happy to take any questions after this little video finishes. Okay, thanks so much everyone. Take care, bye. Right, uh, thanks Alison for your presentation relating to your child and your circumstances and your choices around um, the special school for her, for Sophie. Um, we don't have any questions in chat at this stage, but as everyone knows, the presentations will be available to everybody. If people have questions, we can link you up with those people, or those people up with you um, via Heather. Uh, and so we might keep moving because I think that by now people are sort of hanging out for their lunch break. So thanks so much <laughs> for sharing your story with us. That's okay. No problem. Thank you so much for listening. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Have a great Thanks, afternoon. Alison. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks.